a couple days ago, I got a great question about AI state machines for NPCs, and I wanted to answer that in a video right here. If you're interested in game AI, then make sure that you pay attention. And also, if you have a question of your own, make sure that you drop a comment down below, and maybe I'll do a video about that as well. All right, let's get to the question. So Chili M04 asked or said, hello, Jason, I'm currently working on a state machine for a game and I had a question since you're one of the best Unity tutorial channels for when it comes to professional practices. In my game, there are a large variety of enemies around 30-ish. Most enemy types only have three to five states each, but many of them share things like stun and knockback states. Rather than make new classes for each enemy type, I was hoping to reuse each state as much as possible. And the solution I proposed was having my states be mono behaviors so I can add or remove the types needed and edit their properties in the inspector. From this tutorial and a few others, many state machines don't inherit from mono behavior, so I wanted to ask if this is a bad idea. To go into more detail, none of these state classes will utilize mono behavior functions like update or late update, etc. Just like this tutorial, they're managed by a state machine class attached to an enemy and only the currently active one will be looped. Is this an okay practice or is it advised to avoid using a mono behavior? Thank you very much. And I wanted to say first, thanks for the question because it's a great one and I think that it's gonna help a lot of people. Now, if you just want the quick answer, well then yes, mono behaviors are a perfectly fine way to do this. There are some downsides or caveats though that I wanna briefly talk about. And I wanna really quickly cover the different ways that you can set up these state machines, some of the different options that are available. Let's start with different ways or different types of state machines because I think that that will help make everything else make a lot more sense. There are three different kind of core ways that you can set up state machines or at least three core ways that I see them done often. The first is visually, doing something with visual scripting using something like the Bolt system that's now the built-in visual scripting system or blueprints in Unreal or Playmaker or a lot of people just roll their own setup. Some people use the animation system. Some people use the Canvas system, build their own complete visual node-based system for setting up state machines. This makes it really easy for visualizing what's going to happen with an NPC. You can see exactly how the states transition with little lines and arrows, and it makes it very easy for designers to work with, but it's usually the hardest thing to get set up or the hardest of the options to get set up. There's a lot of work that you have to do to tie everything together so that the visual nodes actually assign or, or work with the AI nodes, or at least a lot more work than the other options. It's not that difficult to get set up though. If you have a lot of designers on your team, I highly recommend you look into it as an option because it'll make things a lot easier in the long run if you're gonna have a large amount of data and things that are gonna change quite often. Now, if that's not the case, there are a couple other options. Things like the components that were mentioned in the question. If you wanna build a component-based system, there are, um, well, there, there's really not a lot of complexity to it. It's about the same as building a standard state machine, which there's a video. I'm going to link the video for the state machine with all of the code that's being referenced here so you can see it and understand it. It's a long thing, and I don't want to go over all of it again because it, it'll just confuse things. But if you want to do component setup, it makes it easier for your designers to kind of put together things or yourself to put together things than the other option that we're going to get into in a moment, which is the all code setup. But it um, typically has a drawback of when you, when you set up multiple components on your game object and you want the transitions to happen, the condition for the transition into a component is typically done on that component. So like the way to get into it, maybe it's a enter this chase state if I have a target and I'm out of range or search for an enemy, enter search for an enemy state or target state if I don't have a target already. Those are usually defined kind of on the on the um, states themselves, and it makes it act a little bit more like, I guess, a behavior tree than a state machine, where with a visual scripting setup, it's kind of easy to bounce around. But a lot of the time, that's exactly what you need. If you just have NPCs that are just running, chasing, and attacking, then making it more like a behavior tree with components. It could still use a state machine, but it's kind of acting as a behavior tree the way that it's going to get the inputs or read the uh, conditions for the transitions into the components. It does also make it very easy to tell what's going on because you can see 
which component is enabled, assuming that you just toggle on the component that the current state is on. You can see what that's in, what that is. You can see the data around it, what it's using, if it's got a target or some other stuff, uh, um, other info in there. Um, but it does have, like I said, that one drawback of being not being able to manage that transition quite as well. And you end up with a, a lot of components on your objects, or you may end up with a lot of components on your objects. The third option, and the one that I usually default to, is an all code-based state machine setup where I'm either using an interface or more often using an abstract class like a um, state machine bait or a I state or sorry an I state would be if I was doing an interface but like a state based class and then uh, inheriting from that and then having a state machine that will do the transitions between those and having a separate state machine class per NPC type if I don't have a lot of NPCs this is where I'll go with if I got like five or less but with 30 or so I think that your other rec your other solution, the one that you're going with right now, the components, makes a lot more sense. You don't want to write custom code for 30 different NPCs, including all their transitions, no matter how powerful it is or how easy it is to just get set up with. It's better to go with something that's more customizable like your components. And before we wrap things up, I wanted to mention an email reply that I just got from Anna, who said that um, she's using... Uh, scriptable objects instead, which I think is another great option. If you haven't tried using scriptable objects, I would maybe commit everything, do a branch, and give it a little experiment. Create an abstract base class that inherits from scriptable object, and then you can assign those scriptable objects to your character as well. This isn't going to necessarily give you any giant benefit over the uh, mono behaviors, and it may make things a little bit more complex, but it might also be an, I think it would be at very least an interesting experiment and probably give you some good ideas. And it's giving me some ideas for some more videos on showing exactly how to do that. If you're interested in that, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll put one of those together. And if this was helpful, hit the thumbs up. And if you got questions, make sure that you drop them in the comments of uh, whatever video you got a question about or this one. And also, if you're interested in multiplayer game dev, don't forget to check out the multiplayer mastery course that's opening on Tuesday. I'll make sure to link that down below. All right, see you in the next video. Bye.